so our challenge for thinking about joint action is to distinguish cases of joint action from cases which involve parallel but merely individual action. And we have seen some problems for attempts to do this by appealing to relatively superficial things like coordination or common events. It's also difficult to do it by appealing to what I call the simple theory, which just involves an intention that we, you and I, block an aisle together, say. Michael Bratman is responsible for the best developed, most sophisticated attempt to answer this question. And I think his view is worth considering carefully, not least because it's been the object of a great deal of critical reflection. And as far as I know, there's no good objection to it that has been published. Bratman's starting point is the notion of shared intention, sometimes also called a collective intention. What we might say as our starting point then is that it's the existence and effects of a shared intention that distinguish joint action from parallel, but merely individual action. So here's Bratman, I'm paraphrasing slightly to use my examples. He says, a first step is to say that what distinguishes the sisters cycling together from strangers cycling side by side is that the sisters share an intention to cycle together, but the strangers do not. But importantly, Bratman immediately notes that we do not yet get very far because we don't yet know what a shared intention is. And in fact, this notion of shared intention can create a kind of confusion from the terminology. So it's important, it's an important idea because while philosophers disagree on almost anything else, you'll see a wide range of philosophers like Margaret Gilbert, who thinks that shared intention is necessary, as well as cognitive scientists like Michael Tomasello, who think that a shared intention is necessary. So the idea is important because it's a focus of agreement. Everyone agrees that shared intention is necessary, disagree about what shared intention is. The term itself can be very confusing. So if we think about sharing, there are really two senses that we might have in mind. One sense is associated with Aisha and her best friend having the same haircut. Now, of course, in a sense, there are two haircuts here. There's Aisha's haircut and Beatrice's haircut. And we're saying that they're the same, right? But we're not saying that there's numerical identity here. There isn't one haircut here. Uh, so sharing in this sense takes us in the direction of the simple theory. The simple theory says, look, there's a shared inten intention in the haircut sense. I intend that we do it together and you intend that we do it together. So we have two intentions, and they have the same content. And so we say they're shared, right? Two haircuts, they have the same style, we say they're shared. So in that sense of sharing, it can't be what people like Brackman have in mind because they reject the simple theory of joint action. Since they reject that theory, they're not thinking about sharing in this sense. But the other sense of sharing, also doesn't fit with their idea at all. So if I say Aisha and her brother share a mother, what I mean, of course, is that there's one person, Aisha's mother, and that person is numerically identical with her brother's mother. Right? We've got a case of numerical identity. So I might say, look, there is one intention, an intention that we do something, and I am the subject of that intention, and you are also the subject of that intention. So now we can say, look, my intention is numerically identical with your intention. There is just one state of mind. The problem here is that although some philosophers have rather bravely attempted to pursue this, we get into some complicated deep water with the idea that the bearers of mental states don't have to be biologically integrated systems or even individuals, but can be plurals. Now that's an interesting idea to pursue, but I think it's very far from the place that we should start. And it certainly has nothing to do with what Bratman, Tomasello, Gilbert and the others have in mind when they talk about shared intention. Right? They're not thinking about sharing in this sense either. So it turns out that when we're using the term shared intention, on most philosophers' views, we're talking about something which is not shared and also not an intention.
So the terminology can indeed be quite confusing. We have to regard shared intention as a term of art for something which is not shared and not an intention. All right, that being the case, what is shared intention? Here's Bratman. Importantly, Bratman's account has two components. He first of all gives us a functional characterization that says what we want shared intentions to do in our lives, and then a substantial account. While many people in the literature are focused mainly on the substantial account, I think it's important to consider the functional characterization because that can do a lot of work for us. Bratman says, shared intention serves to coordinate our activities, coordinate our planning, and structure our bargaining. So if you and I have a shared intention that we cook dinner together, that shared intention should structure our bargaining insofar as we need to agree on what and how to cook in a way that fits with both of our abilities and preferences. The shared intention should coordinate our planning insofar as we need to, for example, bring complementary tools and ingredients to the event, and it needs to coordinate our activity insofar as I will be pouring while you are stirring, right? And those two things are happening not too far apart from each other so that we don't mess things up. So this is the idea. Shared intention plays these three functional roles. And there are also some constraints that we want here. And the first of these is that shared intentions have to be inferentially integrated with ordinary individual intentions. To see why, imagine this situation. You have an individual intention to buy some shoes and a shared intention that we meet for coffee. Now those two things need to constrain each other in your planning. So for example, you may need to plan for us to have a relatively short coffee meeting in order that you still have time to buy the shoes. And you may need to do the shoe shopping around the place where you and I have chosen to buy coffee in accordance with our shared intention. If your plan for the shoe shopping involves some completely different part of town, you will be unable to complete the two things. Now, although it seems like a very simple idea, the notion of inferential integration provides a somewhat powerful constraint because there are many theories about shared intention that make it very difficult to see how this is met. If, like John Searle, you postulate two fundamentally different kinds of attitude, then how do you get the inferential integration between them? You need a further part of your theory in order to guarantee that. Or if, like Remo Tumela has sometimes done, you postulate different modes so that you can either be in an individual mode or a we mode, as he calls it, how are you going to get that inferential integration? It's not that you're two separate agents. You're one agent who has to both buy the shoes and meet with me for the coffee. So inferential integration is a powerful constraint that we should insist is a feature of any account of shared intention. Now we also need not just inferential, but also normative integration. So the principle of agglomeration says in general, roughly, if you have two separate intentions, it's only rational for you to have those two separate intentions if you also have one big intention agglomerating them. So there's nothing at all wrong to have the intention both to lose weight and to eat as much ice cream as possible. Uh, sorry, nothing at all wrong or irrational about having two desires, the desire to lose weight and to eat as much ice cream as possible. Right? Uh, that's a situation I very often find myself in. It's unfortunate, but not irrational. But the intention to eat as much ice cream as possible and the intention to lose weight are not intentions that you should simultaneously and knowingly have together, because as the principle of agglomeration says, it wouldn't be rational for you to have one big intention, the intention to lose weight and eat lots of ice cream. So the principle of agglomeration is very nice, but it helps us in thinking about shared intentions because we should also be able to agglomerate the shared intention with the individual intention. So let's go back to the shoes and the coffee. If it's rational for you to have a shared intention that we meet for coffee and an ordinary individual intention that you buy some shoes, it isn't rational for you to knowingly have both intentions simultaneously unless it's rational for those two things to be agglomerated into an intention that we buy, that we have coffee and you buy shoes, right? If you realize straight away that there's no way that that can happen, then you shouldn't have the whole intention. So this is one way in which we would expect our shared intentions to be normatively integrated with our ordinary individual intentions should be possible to agglomerate them and come up with an intention which is rational. 
All right, good. So now we've given a functional characterization of shared intention and introduced some constraints that we want shared intentions to obey. But we haven't said yet what it is that shared intentions are, what it is that plays these functional roles and meets these constraints. So Bratman's idea, this is the idea, is look, he wants to construct some interconnected intentions and other related attitudes that kind of play the roles characteristic of shared intention. What a brilliant idea, beautifully done, and very clearly explained uh, in his work. So how are we gonna give that construction? Well, the first step is actually taking a page out of the simple theory. That's why we started with the simple, simple theory. He says, look, the first thing we're gonna do is to say that shared intention involves me intending that we paint and you intending that we paint. Right. So we're, we're very close to the simple theory here. Well, why do we need to go any further? Well, Bratman says it's because of the mafia case. Bratman says, look, it's because of the mafia case that we need to go further here. That make case motivates, he said, that we need to have interlocking intentions and we need to intend that our intentions interlock. So it's not enough that we intend that we go to New York by way of you bundling me into the trunk of my car and driving me there. We each have to intend that we paint by way of intentions that we paint, or that we go to New York by way of each other's intentions that we paint. So as you know, the Mafia case is maybe not the best way to illustrate this, but there will be other ways of illustrating this uh, which will allow us to do this. Now the next thing to note here, um, I've included in the handouts, is that Bratman adds a further requirement concerning something called the con connection condition. So if you're feeling ambitious and you feel like you're really understanding Bratman so far, then do check out the further description in the handout, which specifies the connection condition, which is an important and interesting further addition here. On the other hand, if you're just kind of like, if it's not really falling into place yet, you can skip that connection condition idea altogether quite safely. Now at this point, Bratman introduces a further scenario to motivate adding a further condition. So Bratman says, look, well, it might be the case that we intend to paint the house and also that we intend to paint the house by way of each other's intentions that we paint. But my intention is that we paint the house blue and your intention is that we paint the house tartan. Right? Uh, and in this situation, says Bratman, our intentions won't play the role that we want the shared intention to play. And in particular, they won't provide for coordination of our planning. Right? And they, they don't also seem to be structuring our bargaining. So Bratman responds to that example. We both intend to paint the house and we do so by way of each other's intentions. There's no bold coercion involved here. But my intention is that it be blue and your intention that it be tartan. By saying that we have additionally to intend that we paint by way of meshing subplans of each other's intentions. Right? Where for subplans to mesh, is for it be, to be possible to achieve all of them simultaneously. So if I intend to paint the house blue all over and you intend to paint the house tartan all over, uh, those intentions do not mesh. So if those intentions are subplans of our intentions that we, you and I paint the house, then we don't have meshing subplans. Now what you need to note here, of course, is that the requirement Bratman is making is not that we have subplans that actually mesh, it's we have to intend that we paint the house, that the outcome occurs by way of intentions that we paint and by way of meshing subplans. So our intention is that we end up with meshing subplans, but that might be something that we acquire after some discussion, right? When I see you there with that big can of tartan paint, we're gonna to have to have a conversation and work out a way to make our subplans mesh, even though they don't. So it's not the problem that they don't mesh, it's a problem that we have to intend that they mesh. Now with all that in place, there's one major last step that Bratman offers. He adds as a further step that there has to be common knowledge between us of all of these conditions, all of the conditions about the intention and some of those that I'm eliding for simplicity and that you may do so as well. Now just here's kind of a puzzle. So each tiny thing that we added up until this point was carefully justified. We could see quite why Bratman was adding that thing. But in the case of the common knowledge condition, it's much less clear to me at least why we would need common knowledge. So Bratman does add the common knowledge condition. Maybe there's nothing 
wrong with it? But there's a good question, well, you know, why do we, why do we need that condition? So here we are. Here's Bratman's substantial account of shared intention. He says, you and I have a shared intention that we paint the house. If we each intend that we paint the house, I intend that and you intend that. If we each intend that we paint the house in accordance with and because of those intentions and meshing subplans of them. And if all of this is common knowledge between us. So this is Bratman's substantial account of shared intention. And one thing to note here, because I know that some of you are already thinking, gosh, you know, what could be an objection to that? One thing to note here is that Bratman presents himself as giving sufficient but not necessary conditions. So his idea is this. Here's my functional characterization. I want to demonstrate that it is possible to construct just using ordinary individual intentions and common knowledge and a few other tiny bits and pieces that we already need, right? Bits and pieces from our ordinary individual action theory. I want to use those th bits and pieces to construct something which can play the role of shared intention. And he gives the sufficient conditions here because he's not saying this is the only thing that is playing the role. His idea is, look, if we can give a construction of something that can play the role of shared intention, the sufficient conditions, using the ordinary stuff that we already conceptually and normatively have lying around from our theory of individual action, then it's unlikely that you're going to be justified in postulating any conceptual novelty, novelty or any sort of special normative novelty. For example, the idea that intentions can have not just individuals as their subjects, but plural subjects, multiple individuals as their subjects, probably isn't going to be needed. So this is why Bratman is quite content at this point to be giving sufficient but not necessary conditions in his account of shared intention. Excellent. So at this point we have seen Bratman's theory of shared intention, which is an attempt to distinguish joint actions from parallel but merely individual actions. And as far as I know, no one can show yet that it doesn't do so, or at least they haven't published uh, a successful attempt to do so. And so it looks like we have a potential adequate account of shared agency, one that meets this requirement. And if that's right, it will bring us closer to understanding which forms of joint action underpin the social nature of humans.